Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. The good brother. Mark Lamont Hill, welcome. Thanks welcome for back. having me. Good to be here. Good to see y'all in real life. Last time I was on uh, Zoom. Zoom, so right. dope. How are you? Room. I'm good, man. Okay. Good. Just grinding, man. You know, it's been... Uh, a crazy year. Mm -hmm. Got real sick in the fall. Mm -hmm. Had blood clots. Had mm. a mild heart attack. Ugh. It was real. Yeah, it all came from a ruptured Achilles playing ball. Wow. And uh, I mean, literally almost died. Really? And uh, yeah, man. Yeah. So it's been like just the recovery, trying to eat better, trying to live better. You know, just be healthier. So. I'm good, you know. I Break that down from a, a, a basketball injury, blood clots, and a heart attack. Yeah, so like it, it happens a lot where like you get a oh you old you get you rupture your Achilles. So mm -hmm. I I wasn't even doing nothing special. I just took one dribble to the right. I felt something pop in my leg. Thought I got hit. I, actually, I thought I got shot. I was playing a certain neighborhood. I was turning around. Like, <laughs> you yeah, was you in the hood playing. You was yeah. outside. Yeah, I was in the hood playing. It was like it was like me and a couple like my young boys, somebody else. We were just playing. And I was like, if uh, this is a real bad way to, to, to die at 42, 43 yeah, yeah, years yeah. old. But it wasn't. I was good, right? I turned around, saw nobody was there, went to the hospital. They told me it was completely ruptured. Uh, about three weeks later, I started getting shortness of breath. I thought it was just because I was hopping around the house. Um, it wasn't that. And then I was typing, I was working on a book, and I went to the bathroom and I couldn't breathe. The room was spinning, and I like passed out on the bathroom floor, woke mm -hmm. myself up. Like I don't know how, honestly. Crawled down the steps, got to the ambulance. Oh they said if I got there just a little bit, little bit later, I probably would have died. So you had to call nine one one for yourself. I had to call nine one one for myself. Wow. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah. It was, it was crazy, man. So, you know, I was very lucky. Had blood clots covering all my whole left lung, almost all of my right lung, and uh, yeah. Damn. That's Sheesh. So, and that all came from an Achilles. All from Achilles. I had deep. I had a DVT right. So basically, I had a clot in my leg that rose up. To my, to my lungs, and I didn't notice it right away because, you know, I just didn't notice it, and I didn't have a, some of the symptoms you normally have. Mm -hmm. And, I, yeah, and, and, and it happens to a lot of people. Kevin Durant, he, he told me that, uh, he said that after he ruptured his Achilles, that's the mm -hmm. thing he was most terrified of, and so he was constantly, like, looking at it, Checking. Trying, getting it checked. So what's the treatment for it? Nothing you could really do. I mean, they, they, they pulled the clots out. I was in the hospital for a few days. They pulled the clots out, and after that, I take blood thinners. I may have to take them for the rest of my life. But that's okay. That's a small price to pay. Yeah, to still be here. To be here, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm good. Man. Well, happy you're here, my yeah, brother. Absolutely. And you got the new book, Seen and Unseen. And, and I love the, the topic you tackle in this book. You talk about visual media and how it shifted the, the narrative on race and reignited the push towards justice. So do you think social media is, I guess, do you think social media is helping or hurting? Hmm, that's a good question. I always say social media takes people who should be closer together and pulls them apart. Like, mm -hmm. you might be with your family and everybody on their cell phone, or you might be on the couch with your lady or, or, or your partner, whoever, and, and y'all both doing something different. That's right. You know, that pulls people apart. But then you have people um, who are far apart, who should be far apart. You, when you argue with that, that troll, or <laughs> like my man the other day arguing with Drake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a, took a hard L, but like, <laughs> you, you end up people who you shouldn't even be engaging. That's right. It pulls you closer to them, and so, some, that's the that's the danger of it, but there's a way that it helps us organize, man. We wouldn't right. be talking about George Floyd. We wouldn't have went down in Ferguson if it wasn't for social media and technology, like you said. Yeah. Somebody filmed that, and then everybody had a chance to actually see what happened, rather than try to recount something that happened from witnesses that were there. Now you have the film. Now you have a whole society of people that are able to witness and visually. There's no way you don't feel something right from watching that. Yes, and the thing is, and this is what I, we tackle in the book. It's not new. We've always used technology that way. We mm -hmm. just have better technology now. Mm -hmm. So think about... Rodney King, sure. Rodney King, right? That was a stroke of luck. I mean, mm -hmm. the odds of yeah. getting somebody getting their behind beat by the police with a camcorder. You don't remember a big camcorder. You needed yeah. the tape. You need to make sure the tape was clean, put the tab, you know, a little paper in the joint to make sure, you, you know, you, you could record over it. You needed all those things to happen in the instant that somebody's getting beaten. Now everybody can pull out the phone. Mm -hmm. But that moment changed the conversation because all of a sudden America, especially white America, couldn't say they didn't know. Mm -hmm. right? But that wasn't the first time. Look at Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. When we got beat on the Pettus Bridge fighting for trying to get voting rights, and Dr. King said, y'all aren't going to beat us in the dark anymore. Y'all aren't going to beat us in the woods of Alabama. Y'all not going to beat us in private. We're going to make all of America, we're going to sit on this bridge and show the viciousness of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so now the social media was the evening news. The technology was the, the, uh, the news camera. You mm -hmm. know, when Emmett Till is killed, Jet Magazine. Mm -hmm. That when Emmett Till's face is on Jet Magazine, that's the social media. Yeah, right? Amer America's done that too. You you know better than me, but the Vietnam War. Like yeah. when they started showing the images of the Vietnam War to get people 
riled up about like, no, this this is an unjust war. Exactly. Yeah. When people saw those bodies mm -hmm. and people whose bodies they thought were mournable, because black bodies aren't mournable in this country unless it's something gruesome. But when they started seeing their next door neighbors, That's right. when they started seeing their kids, their students, their friends, when they started seeing them dying in this war, now they said, we got to stop this thing. Mm -hmm. So so black people have always been tactical about how we use media and technology, especially. And now, because everybody has access to it, everybody has a phone. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's much easier to do. Mm -hmm. In the first chapter, you talk about the, the spectacle of, of death, and you you start off with the the why. Yeah. What is the why? You know, it's a good question because if you w would have asked me five years ago what the moment for this generation was, I would have said it was Mike Brown. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine anything bigger than Mike mm -hmm. Brown laying on on, on Canfield for three and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. If you would asked me before that, I would have said it was it was Trayvon Martin, right? Because right. we were all organized for that, right? But this is the moment. Absolutely. This is the moment. And the why of it is, well, partly because America had to sit there and look at it, mm -hmm. right? With Mike Brown, we had testimony, we had stories, we had theories. You know, with Trayvon Martin, we had George Zimmerman, who we knew was racist. Right. But, but it was still different, right? America had to sit there in a pandemic when we weren't leaving. We were all in our houses. We had our phones out, and we had to sit there for nine minutes, more than nine minutes, and watch George Floyd be executed. Mm -hmm. White people can't pretend anymore. Mm -hmm. they, they, white people like to pretend. They like to be innocent. They like to act like this thing ain't real. But when somebody's dying in front of you, and with the knee on the neck, too, there's no tussle. There's no battle. Mm -hmm. There's no, well, what if he had a knife? What if he was running? What if, what kid, if he had a gun in his car? What if he had a gun in his car? Mm -hmm. You can't say any of that because it's right in front of you. Broad daylight. Broad, broad daylight. Mm -hmm. And he ain't do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? At worst, you could say he passed a 20. Mm. That ain't worth dying for. That's not a capital offense. And then what people try to do is bring up his past and say, well, he was this, he was that. Yep. And the media, certain media outlets will run with things like that. And then you see that on social media, too. Yeah. This guy was no hero. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. And he's not. We, we wrote that in the book. Yeah. He's not a hero, but he is a martyr. Right. I don't have to be a hero to not die. And, and that's the thing that they try to tell. Oh, he's no, he got weed in his system. Who done that weed in their system? You, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like it's the, the rules they make up for us. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's the most ridiculous thing I have ever seen in my life. Tra they go to your suspension records. They mm -hmm. talk about what you did in kindergarten. They mm -hmm. talk about, I mean, with Mike Brown, he stole a cigarillo. He stole a blunt out the store. Darren Wilson didn't even know he stole the blunt out the right. store when he killed him. But even if he did, you don't get the electric chair for that. You don't get a lethal injection for that. You don't get executed for that. But we sometimes, and this is black people too, we, we're so committed to making ourselves look a certain way in front of white people, the kind of respectability politics, mm -hmm. that we only advocate for perfect victims. We only advocate for the people mm -hmm. who are about to go to college. Mm -hmm. We only advocate for straight people. We only advocate for cis cisgender people. When was that time there was a national outrage for a trans woman who died? Mm -hmm. Nine black trans women were killed the summer that Mike Brown was killed. We ain't hear none of their names, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have any gay male people who we look to and say, you know what, we're riding for him, right? It tends to be Christian, straight, heterosexual males, at least at least that's how it looks. Mm -hmm. And because we want to look a certain way and feel good about it. And middle-class black people don't feel good about saying, well, he stole something from the store, mm -hmm. so therefore we, we're going to, uh, we, we, you know, we're going to still fight for him. Nah, we'd be like, ah, I wish we had a better case. Can we, can we talk about the hero thing? Because I think sometimes when people be like, oh, he wasn't a hero, they necessarily think he was a villain. No, right. you just, normal. You just He's a, human. a person. A person. He's yeah, a person. Yeah, yeah. People do fucked up things. Like, all of us, and, and I'm not excusing anything that George Floyd did or anything that anybody's done, right? But George Floyd, as we talk about in the book, he was improving. He was fighting for sobriety. He loved his kids. He was working for a job. He was trying to he was trying to do something with himself like so many people in this country are trying right. to do, but especially black males in America. He was praying. He went through a lot of trauma. Yes. Things mm -hmm. that he had to deal with in his own personal life. Exactly. He I got that we have clean, to say that, Then the pandemic hit. And you have to really humanize what people's circumstances are. It's something that we all go through. But I hate all that we us. have to say that, though. Right. Like right. I hate that we have to say he was improving. He was doing. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. He was a yeah, person. Right. He was a human being. Right. right. That right. did nothing. Right. He could have not been improving. Right. He could have not been improving. He could have been terrible. He wasn't. But he could have been a terrible human it being. Matter, it doesn't right. matter. Right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. just don't it kill still him. didn't warrant that yeah, at all. Period. Don't I can't him. breathe. Like. Right. He caught crying for his mom in public, and people don't think. Shout out to Darnella Frazier for shooting it and for for videotaping. Because mm -hmm. that's courageous, too. People act like, I mean, I, I think sometimes we do too much videotaping and not enough intervention. And she felt bad about that. Like she said, that, right. you know, you feel some type of trauma from witnessing that and then feel like, should I have done something? Right. And here I am. Because then people get mad at you. Like, oh, you was just standing there filming it and you right. didn't even do anything. And I think it depends on the situation. In that case, I don't expect this, this, this black girl mm -hmm. to jump. Four cops were standing there. Right. Mm -hmm. Cops didn't intervene. If they not intervening, what's she going to do? And if she does intervene, does she get shot? Does she get a knee on her neck? I understand why she might not have intervened. Exactly. But 
a lot of times we will videotape a fight. We will videotape mm-hmm. somebody getting their ass whooped in public and not do anything about mm-hmm. it on trains, on street corners. And that's why I get frustrated. It's like we have to intervene. We can't become so obsessed with the videotape uh, that we don't actually stop the thing from happening because right. the police can't save us. I'm an abolitionist. The police can't be the answer. We got to be the answer. And, and 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 sometimes we get so caught up in the surveillance and the spectacle of it because that'll get us likes, that'll get us clicks, right. that'll get us streams that we forget that this is about human life and this is about loving ourselves and, 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 and each other. I agree with that in a case like George Floyd, but I mean, let's say you at the Chappelle show and you just happen to walk in and you see all those dudes beating up on the guy. You don't know why they're beating up on him. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know what I'm in that case, I'm my, my mama business. Oh, I am completely minding my own business. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this every nine minutes. I'm just saying. Oh, no, no. I say, that's why I said to George Floyd. That's oh. totally different. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. That's the police doing something they have no business doing. Yeah. If I see, if I see, particularly if it looks like a, a, a fair fight, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and it ain't got yeah. nothing to do with me. Some people earn that. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, in this case, the, the Dave Chappelle thing, I don't know who earned what. All I know is if that I'm wasn't a, a fair sh- fight, but he earned it. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a fair f- Yeah, it wasn't a fair fight. It wasn't but, a fair but, fight. but he earned it, though. Oh, he earned it. If I'm on stage doing anything, Anything, yeah. and you tackle me. All bets are off. Right. I, I will owe you. I don't owe you a fair fight, and especially if I got security because yeah. you already catching me off guard. And he had that knife with the fake gun and all of that. Yeah, you don't know what that, could, how, how did that get do? I don't know, man. I heard security was terrible out there that weekend, but that's even got to scare brothers like you, though, Mark. Because oh yeah, you get death threats every day, all day. I do. I do. <laughs> have I you do. had? A, have you had an incident like that at all? Nah, people. Ninety nine percent of people who talk shit on the internet don't do nothing when they see you in person. They, you don't even know them in real life. Mm-hmm. Y'all know this. I mean, mm-hmm. y'all know it better mm-hmm. than me. I mean, people people don't. I mean, 99% of Ask people Charlamagne if, if, if the same has happened to him. Charlamagne's had numerous incidents. Well, not numerous, but I've had two. No, I, 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 I know, but that's what I'm saying. But, I mean, but think about, think what's the ratio of that two? Yeah, to, no, to, I'm to with every you. single, you know people, every yeah, single true. day I get it. I'm going to kick your ass. I'm going to fuck you up. I'm going to do something. <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm pretty. I'm not. I'm not asking people to do it. So I'm not, <laughs> but I'm not that hard to find. It don't happen. So I don't worry about it in that way, um, and I don't worry about it from black people for the most part. Um, sometimes when I touch certain areas ar- ar- around race or gender or, gen- or whatever the thing might be, and I'm in public, sometimes you know people are calling bomb threats, death threats, and occasionally you worry about it. You know what I mean? But like in general, I don't. I don't worry about that stuff, mm-hmm. man. But the culture is changing. Yes. People feel emboldened mm-hmm. by this. That's right. From from the the Will people said the Will Smith thing set this off. I don't think it's just the Will Smith thing. I think it's all that you know what I mean. Pull up, catch me outside, yeah. all that shit. Like that is the thing. It's the culture of like I'm I, I'm gonna do something when I see you in public. That's emboldening people mm-hmm. to actually mm-hmm. do something in public. And people are gonna learn the hard way. That's right. That it's not gonna work out the way they think it is. That's right. And 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 that's why you know. And the Chappelle thing is complicated because I don't know why dude is is attacking Dave Chappelle. I don't I don't know anything about the story yet. We don't know yet. We're waiting yeah. to find out. Mm-hmm. Um, Chappelle's made a lot of people angry too, but that doesn't warrant his that response. Correct. You know what I mean. So if you run up on him and you end up getting carted away with your, with your arm look like it got put back on backwards, that's. If he got shot, I wouldn't be upset. Fake gun. Yeah, no, knife. I, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that to happen. But yeah, I would. I understand. I, I, I wouldn't would lose. A, I wouldn't lose an ounce of sleep. And yeah. somebody wrote me with a, a, a what looks like a knife and gun at the Hollywood Bowl, and I end up and, I, and you end up getting shot. I, what can I do? Right. What yeah. I'm trying to go home to my family. Yeah. You know, when you talk about, um, you know, like we all know all the benefits of social media when it comes to the social justice movement. I, what, what, what bothers me is the trauma that I know it causes. Yeah. These are these are like you're watching these videos. It, even when you're talking about the George Floyd video, I like damn. Yeah. I can feel the anxiety I first felt when I watched that video. Like that doesn't leave you when you see it. So I, that's that's what makes me keep wondering: is it helping or is it hurting? What I tell people is. It helps that we know the video exists. Mm-hmm. Everybody know there's not a person in America that doesn't know about Rodney King, not a person in America who doesn't know about George Floyd. You don't have to watch it, though. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I tell people to engage in some self-care about that. Mm-hmm. But your point is a profound one, which is the steady stream of images mm-hmm. of black death. And it's black death. White people do not have to worry about turning on social media and seeing people who That's look right. like them get killed, right? Mm-hmm. There's Asian people don't, don't worry about turning on the evening news, cable news, and seeing like they, themselves be murdered or beaten mm-hmm. or, or other things. It does normalize it, and it can objectify our body. So, so on the one hand, when you see it, you're outraged. But if you see it all the time, mm-hmm. it just makes you one. It traumatizes us because mm-hmm. it, it's people we know, or people who could be George Floyd could be us. Mm-hmm. You know, Tamir Rice could be us. Um, Breonna Taylor could be us. 
but it also can make it so normal to people that they stop being outraged. It's like when you hear five people in Chicago were shot or there was a bombing in Lebanon or, you know, whatever, right? There's or there's famine in Africa. There's certain things that we hear so much mm -hmm. that it's hard to be outraged every day that's by right. it. And so black death, we have to kind of balance that. But that's the balance we've always had to have. Ida B. Wells, she took the postcards, um, oh, she took the images of lynching that white people were using as postcards. Mm -hmm. They'd be lynchings, and, and they would send them out as postcards. They would take black fingers and toes and use them as souvenirs. They were celebrating those images. She took those images to create a, a moral panic to say, look, they are killing us. We're hanging from trees. And some people said this causes trauma. Mm. But she understood the balancing act of that. Now, there are some people on the Internet who make their, their business on black trauma. Mm -hmm. they, they make their whole enterprise just showing black trauma. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. There has to be a balance of trauma and healing, of intervention, of support, and of organized action, not just for ourselves, but to actually stop the shit from happening. And I think the other thing that bothers me, it's not changing the culture of policing. Clearly, no. they don't care. They don't mm -mm. care whether it's on camera, off camera, they don't care. That's what we've been saying in, in the abolitionist movement for a long time is like, reforms don't work. People thought body cameras would save us. Right, just like back when when I was I was an activist as a teenager during the Rodney King time, it was like fire the police. Then they just hire more mm -hmm. because it's a culture. Then it was get black get black cops. Then we were getting beaten by black cops. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They have them live in your neighborhood. Then they know where you, they know where to find you. You know these aren't the solutions because policing is the problem. Mm -hmm. And body cameras now sometimes they will help, but the body mm -hmm. cameras do more to exonerate cops right. than they do to to get justice for the people who so are killed by cops. What is the solution, in your opinion? Abolish police. Abolish police, get rid of policing, and imagine a new way. In totality. In totality. Abolish police and abolish prisons. We got to do it. Now, it's a it's an incremental process. So what do you do for people that commit crimes? Where do you put them, and how do you police neighborhoods? Well, first, we got we to gotta reimagine, because even as you're talking about it, or you say, how do you police neighborhoods? Neighbors don't have to be policed. Neighbors have to be safe. Mm -hmm. Neighbors have to be protected. Um, but there's crime in every neighborhood. There is crime. But see, crime, all right, let me take one step back. Mm -hmm. Crime is a social construct. Mm -hmm. what, what do I mean by that? People don't commit crimes, they commit acts. And some acts get criminalized. Mm -hmm. For example, if we were to all smoke weed right now, mm -hmm. that would not in New York, that would not be a crime. It's not a crime in New York. 10 years ago, it, it would be a crime. Mm -hmm. Correct. The moral nature of it, or the immoral nature of it hasn't changed, the ethics of it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Whether I thought it was right or wrong doesn't change because my ethics aren't tied to the law exclusively, right? Mm -hmm. So crime changes across space and time. If somebody decides something is a crime, black people being free, black people reading was a crime. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I try not to use the language of crime because crime is a contract. I'm not trying to be all academic as exactly. much as... Mm -hmm. No, no, but it's, it's a great question. For me, it's more about saying people commit harm. How do we deal with acts of harm? Mm -hmm. And Because and so, that allows us to shrink the, the net. Because if we say crime, all, all kinds of stuff is a crime. Mm -hmm. But if we shrink and say, how do we reduce harm in our neighborhoods? Well, the first thing we got to do is get at the thing, get at the root causes. That's when we say radical. Radical is a, a way of saying get at the root cause. Mm -hmm. The root cause of most harm, most crime, is poverty. Mm -hmm. It's inequality. Most people don't rob people just to rob people. Some people do, but most people don't. When people have jobs, they commit crime less. When people have libraries, they commit crime less. If they commit, when they have school access, coaches, music programs, arts, they commit crime less. Um, so we got to get at that stuff. We have to... Um, uh, reimagine what safety looks like. So, for example, even an example I gave earlier about stop videotaping people getting beat up mm -hmm. and jump in and stop it. We can complete our own neighborhoods. We can mm -hmm. we can have community watches and things like that. We can have public safety forces. When somebody's my man in Atlanta got drunk, fell asleep in the uh, parking lot of a Burger King. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, in the police, he ran away, and the police yeah, like shot him. Shot yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. And and you can say don't run from the police. <clears throat> That's what a lot of people say. Fine, don't run from the police, right? But the fact that the only people you could call, the man was sleeping in his car, mind his own business, right? But the only people we could call was an armed police force whose job is to escalate. What if we had a public safety force who could get that man home, right? We mm -hmm. He wouldn't have committed a crime. And that whole interaction would not have happened. Now, I know anybody listening to this when I talk about abolition, particularly prison abolition, will say, yeah, that sounds good for drunks and that sounds good for drugs because we can decriminalize drugs. Correct. But I know some niggas that's crazy. That's right. Or you could say that, you know, I think Angela Yee reported a couple of days ago that there was so many, how many, like 80,000 businesses looking for people to work and nobody wanted to work. Yeah. So, Part, so you said people are looking for jobs, people need jobs, but now there are jobs out there, people don't want to work. There's, some people don't want to work, but we also need to give people living wage jobs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and I I know the difference. If, if you're paying somebody $8 an hour, 
and you don't have any money, yeah, I'll tell people work, right? I got, I, I take care of a lot of people, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And a lot of them don't want, don't work, you know what I mean? And they're like, they, they're too proud to work for the $8 an hour, mm-hmm. but they're not too proud to call me with a cash app request once every other week for money. So I get the frustration. Mm-hmm. But at some point, we got to give people living wage jobs. You can't have a life of dignity for $7, $8, $9 an hour. If we give people $15 an hour minimum, it's just a start, I think suddenly people are in a much different place. And, and then those jobs grow. So, so that's, that, that's part of the issue. But we do need to think about safety for people who commit sexual crimes. Mm-hmm. We do need to think about safety mm-hmm. for people who uh, are serial killers, uh, murderers. You know, I'm not saying oh, that. When we, you say safety, you mean what do you, you mean? So th- there's a small number of people in the in society that need secured confinement. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. You know for what sure, I mean? For sure, for sure. But we could have but there's other ways to imagine secured confinement outside the logic of the prison. The problem is the only thing we know is a prison. Mm-hmm. The only thing we mm-hmm. know is a policeman. If the only thing I have is a hammer, everything is going to look like a nail, mm-hmm. right? But if I can um, get new tools so that when somebody has a mental health breakdown, I don't have to call the police. If somebody mm-hmm. has a drug overdose, I don't have to call the police. I could call social workers. I could call therapists. You know what I mean? And that that's for that small slice of people that might need to be out of society for a while. We can have facilities. We can have spaces to help them. That's mm-hmm. not nobody is a child molester or a serial killer who doesn't have mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Right? You're not. There's no such thing as a normal serial killer, mm-hmm. right? So we can secure them from society, but for what purpose? Not just to keep them in a cage, but to actually heal them and improve them so they can enter society at some point. Yeah, and also mm-hmm. figure out what's wrong so maybe you can prevent it early. I don't, right. you know, like they have all of these studies about you can look at somebody's head shape and tell what they mm-hmm. might end up doing. Mm-hmm. Like let's. I hate to say it like this, but let's do some research on them. Like we we should we should do research and, and anti racist research because the <laughs> the head shape, interestingly enough, you know, phrenology was this, mm-hmm. the science of measuring skulls, and that's what they used to use to say that black people were were less intelligent and all this other stuff. Mm. But there are things in the brain, you know, that 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 are predictive of criminality mm-hmm. that some people say I don't know enough about that that mm-hmm. area to say. But we should be doing research and studying. But we're more interested in not stopping people from doing harm, but catching people doing harm. Do you feel like this is a real, like something that could potentially happen, right? To yeah. get rid of police, to get rid of prisons. Absolutely, it's, it's happening. Sometimes, you know, like when the Republicans be like, "I hate Obamacare, I hate Obamacare, Obamacare." They be like, "You like being covered to you twenty five? Yeah. Do you like, you, you know, yeah? You you list all the stuff, and they like all the things on it. They just don't like Obamacare because they don't like Obama. Mm-hmm. Similarly, people tend to like abolition. Mm-hmm. They just don't like the language of it because it scares them. But at the end of the Obama presidency, and really starting back up now, um, the end of bail, right? The end of, of cash bail, right? Saying we're gonna we're gonna get rid of cash bail. The end of privatized prisons. These are all abolitionist moves, right? If I say, no, nope, there are people in jail right now because they don't have enough money not to be in jail, mm-hmm. right? Khalif Browder is the classic example, right? right? Mm-hmm. He only died because he didn't have enough money to not be in jail, right? Uh, Sandra Bland was over the weekend because she didn't have enough money to not be in jail, right? Mm-hmm. Getting rid of Cash bail means people are leaving prison. That's decarceration. Giving people suspended sentences. That's decarceration. Work release. That's decarceration. Giving giving people jobs instead of going to jail. That's decarceration. And then excarceration. The idea of saying we're going to make fewer things crimes. We're going to shrink the net of criminality. De- decriminalizing drugs. Mm-hmm. Decriminalizing gambling. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, if you and I want to shoot dice on the corner, why does the state care? Right? Mm-hmm. But so so by 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 shrinking that. Fewer people go go to go to go to prison because fewer people are committing crimes. Mm-hmm. So, in essence, I think we are moving toward abolition. You know, the language of abolition sometimes scares people. The language of defunding scares people. But we've been defunding for a long time. What do these confined spaces look like? You think? I know you're saying it's a place where you can help rehabilitate people for real. So, yeah. what would you imagine that to be? It depends on the case, but a lot of it comes with mental health treatment. A man shot Ronald Reagan, right? President Reagan, mm-hmm. right? He didn't kill Ronald Reagan. Reagan. Uh, actually wanted to forgive him and did forgive him. Um, the man went to a mental health treatment facility. He got care. He got drugs. He got he got things that he needs. He wasn't put in a cage. He didn't do 23 and 1. You know, he, he wasn't in a hole. He got medical treatment. And he's out. He was released about a decade ago. And he doesn't have any problems. He's not causing harm. This man shot the president and still is able to have a functional life because they put him in a treatment facility for care. We have to figure out what people's needs are. Abolition is less about what we don't want. That's what everybody always talks about. We don't want police. We don't, we, we don't want prisons. It's more about the world that we do want. It's about saying, what does the world look like when all of your needs are met? And there's a long tradition of black women, black feminist scholars in particular, who have helped us imagine it. Angela Davis, Joy James, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Mariam Kaba, you know, people like that, who have said, look, let's, let's imagine the, the world that is not yet and produce it. And so for me, 
I don't have all the answers, but that's mm -hmm. part, that's a big part of it, is the is the medical treatment and, and the care. But let's also start dreaming about that. We dream of of new ways to build prisons. We dream of new ways to incarcerate more people. We dream of new technologies to kill people. You know, we got human we got uh, humanless drones that kill people in war, weapons of war. We can mm -hmm. we we have a great imagination for death and war and violence. We now need one for peace and safety and, and healing. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, especially if you're going to call these facilities correctional facilities. Right. What are you correcting? Mm -hmm. They don't correct shit. And, yeah. and, and, and that, that is the most frustrating part to me. You know, when, um, and, and some of them don't even do it anymore. Now that we just, they're just honest about it. At least they be like, we're here to punish. Right, we getting rid of library. We getting rid of GED program. Mm -hmm. We getting rid of. You, you, we're gonna we're gonna make phone calls fifty dollars mm -hmm. instead of five dollars by doing those things. We're gonna keep you fifty miles from family. All the things that actually correct or rehabilitate, That's right. like seeing family, talking to people, education. We're gonna get rid of all of it. We just gonna put you in this cage until you can leave, and then we are gonna make money off off your release because we know you're coming back. You know, the I, I, the abolished police sounds very extreme, because mm -hmm. I do think there are some police officers who act as those public safety people that you spoke about. There's some officers who are from the community, know the community, they patrol the community, they treat people with respect. Yeah. The broad... They're good people with a bad job. Yes, the broad culture of policing is bad, but I think there are some, there are some good police officers, and I'm like, who am I going to call when certain things happen? Or when you, you know, like at the crib, if the alarm goes off, police will just come and walk around the yard, make sure everything good, you know, say hi to me if they see me, you know, and keep it moving. It's just like, ugh. I, I, I get it. I, I get So So first thing is, the the problem with policing isn't just culture. It's the actual system and the mm -hmm. structure. The culture comes out of that system. So you're right, the culture of policing is terrible. Um, but the system of policing is the problem. And I'm saying I don't think it can be repaired. And there are good cops, you know what I mean? But it's, it's funny, we only have this level of defense with the police, right? If I said, you know, public schools are fucked up, nobody would say, yeah, but I had a great teacher, right? I mean, they would say that, but they wouldn't, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't use that as an argument against public schools being fucked up, right? They would say, we need to change the schools, blah, 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 despite these good teachers. They're good people in a bad system. That's kind of how I see policing. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a dysfunctional system, and there are people who have good. I know I know people who, who became police because they want to stop crime. Right. Mm -hmm. I know people who became police because they want to make the world safer. I know I know mm -hmm. people who who are good at their doing their job to the extent that the job lets them do it. So let's give them a new role in a new system. Those might be the people we bring into this new system. And you're right. Who do we call? The problem is, we only know to call police. Again, we only have a hammer, so everything mm -hmm. looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. But what if we ha what if we develop the public safety force? So that somebody could drive around. So when you when you see something, you know we we um you you, you can get some kind of protection or safety. The most it's kind of like Erica Ford with her life camp, and how she does. They have people who do interventions. I love what that Erica are trained does. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for mm -hmm. that purpose to de-escalate situations. Yes, violence interruption. In Chicago, we have violence interrupters. We have conflict resolution. You know, I mean, think about what you do when if you if you out at the club or the bar or whatever, or we older now. If you just at the restaurant with your friends and and somebody, gets, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm true. about to say I ain't been to right, the club yeah. long. <laughs> but <laughs> you, your homie gets drunk. He's too drunk to drive. He gets in the car. He pulls out the keys. You don't call the police on him, mm -hmm. right? You manage the situation. You take the keys from mm -hmm. him. You call an Uber. You do something to make sure that that situation right. gets. That's what we can do. If I'm even now, although with his leg, I move a little slower. If I see two, two young boys fighting on the street, I'm going to jump in and intervene. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to break it up. I'm mm -hmm. not going to call the police on them and say there's an mm -hmm. assault, there's disorderly conduct. Right? We as black people, especially and people in the hood, especially intervene in mm -hmm. these kinds of things. So to me, my imagination to who we're going to call is let's create, a, let's create new systems that intervene the way we naturally do as a village as opposed to bringing outsiders in to do it. And some of those people that are the good cops, the ones that, that, that you know, that, that, that break up fights, that work at the police athletic league, the ones that, that, that say, look, man, you're supposed to be in school. Go back mm -hmm. home. I mean, I, I had that before. I cut school. I've had cops yeah. stop me just to go, nigga, go to school. You know what I mean? They didn't lock me up. They didn't bring, I get that. Those might be the ones we want on a new community force, but maybe they don't need all the accoutrement of, of policing. No, I can see that because I'm like, I, I, you know, I can imagine a world with no police. I can't imagine a world with no security. Yes. You know what I mean? But do you see how the only way we can imagine security is with police? Yeah. That, that, yeah. That, that's what it means to live yeah. in a carceral world. Mm -hmm. our, our minds are so constrained. Our imaginations are incarcerated by this, by this system. It's just like when we say safety, the only thing we can think of is... The only thing we can think of justice is punishment, and punishment is confinement. You know, and it doesn't make you whole again. If that, that, that chain looks very, very expensive, mm -hmm. right? If I were to, if you were to set it down, which you wouldn't do, right? You go to the bathroom. He's gonna call the police, Mark. 
Don't even think about it. Whatever you're about to say, don't yeah, even think about it. He's, 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 he's definitely going to call. He, he's definitely going to call the police. No, no, no. And, and it's, I, I'm not clowning. I'm saying I, I understand. If that chain came back missing, and you heard I had got, I had left the studio with it. You would call the police, right? Goddamn right. All right. So the police lock me up. I do two years for t- for, for taking your chain. You still don't have a chain. And if I don't have a job, to, and nobody pays restitution in real life, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? It don't get back to you nine times out of ten. I've spent two years in a cage, and you still don't have a chain. You are not whole. Mm-hmm. There ha- so a lot of times the people who are the victims of harm don't get made whole again from, from, from me being locked up or from somebody being locked up. So what would it mean for me to come up with a plan to get you your stuff back? What would it mean for me to come up with a plan to get you your money back or to get you that chain? I probably can't afford to get to pay for the chain again if I stole it. It's but, costume jewelry. Uh, so, so maybe definitely I can, not. right? De- but, definitely not. But, <laughs> but at least, <laughs> at least we would work out something that would allow you to be whole again, mm-hmm. right? The logic of prison says, who did it and how do we punish them? The logic of abolition says, who was harmed and how do we make them whole again? It's just a whole different way of looking at the world. You know, but we can't look at the world at all unless we look at it with pure eyes. And like we talk about in the book, this new moment allows us to realize that media and technology give us a wider lens to understand why these systems don't work and give us a wider lens to understand that just because we look at a a, a piece of tape. Mm -hmm. Think about how many debates we had about whether Will Smith was right or whether Chris Rock was right. Mm -hmm. We all looked at the same tape, right? You know how many people looked at... Uh, uh, Rodney King. There were lots of white folk that said, eh. or Ahmaud Arbery. Or Ahmaud Arbery. About in the book. Well, he looked but, like he was stealing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? We can all. But you know what? I just think about like, look at Ahmaud Arbery's family and everybody that was watching what happened, where mm-hmm. uh, Travis and Gregory McMichael chased him down, basically, um, you know, murdered him for yeah. really no reason. They said he was on a property. Uh, right. that everybody wasn't theirs. Was, everybody right. was going and looking at a house getting renovated. No big deal. He didn't take anything. He didn't do anything. But imagine like what his family would feel like or what people would feel like if there was no, quote, punishment for yeah. the McMichaels. I understand that. But first of all, a lot of the families who have people killed don't call for the death penalty. Mm-hmm. They don't call well, maybe for, not the death penalty, for but... life in prison. I mean, they want punishment. Right. Uh, most people do. But I'm not sure that if somebody kills... Because this is the classic death penalty argument. It's the classic mm-hmm. life in prison argument. I don't believe argument. in a death penalty. No, I know. Yeah. I know you don't. <laughs> You're a humane, reasonable, just person. But I, I guess my point is people always say, well, if it happened to you, this is the argument for any kind mm-hmm. of punishment. If it happened to you, you would, you would feel different. And I might. Mm-hmm. If somebody were to uh, do harm to my mother mm-hmm. or one of my children, right, I would want revenge. Yeah. I wouldn't call the police for the revenge, personally. But I would want revenge. But that's not when I'm at my most rational and sane. The death penalty advocates always, they'd be like, well, if someone came in the house and raped your whole family and killed him, you'd want the death penalty. I might. But why, we don't make public policy when we're at our most angry and hurt and personally affected. I mean, mm-hmm. if you cut me off on, on the West Side Highway on the wrong day, I might want to be violent, right? But I mm-hmm. wouldn't say that anybody who cuts somebody off should get violence. You get what I'm saying? Like that, that's not that's not my most rational mode. So I think we do have to do something for the families, but let's meet with the families and figure it out. And, but also families can't it, families can't be the only deciders, mm-hmm. right? Because sometimes the it's like the guy in the Godfather, right? When he, the, the first scene, he wanted the, the guys hurt. Uh, the guy's daughter was hurt, and 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 Vito was like, I, I can't. You want me to do murder? That wouldn't be just because your daughter's still alive, right? So there has to be some kind of way of deciding what a just result is for harm. I get what you're saying, yeah. but, you know... It can't I, be the state. But I look at it like this, right? I got a daughter. She's 20 years old. If somebody kills my daughter, I don't want to hear... I don't want him on this earth anymore. Point blank, period. Mm-hmm. Somebody kills my mother. I don't want him on the earth anymore. I don't want him to get 20 years and get out for good behavior and they get to live their life because of the decision they made. You kill my daughter, I don't want you here anymore. That's point blank, period. You could say death penalty, you could say die, or we could take it in the streets. If you kill my daughter, I don't want you living. I don't want you breathing. So you believe in the death penalty? If if you kill my daughter, absolutely. How about they kill somebody else's daughter? I, I don't know the feeling. You see, right. I, I know how I feel about my daughter. I know how right. I feel about my family. And if you kill my daughter, who's a, a a 20-year-old college student that has a life to live, that doesn't hurt nobody, that's a good kid, and if somebody randomly kills her, I don't want them to live anymore. I wouldn't want them to live either, right? And if that means, if you say, well, Envy, you support the death penalty? I want that person to die. Right. Those are two different things. So I would want so that person to die too. Is. Right. If that happened to me, I would want that person to die as well. 
again, but what I don't want to do is make policy based on my that personal feeling. Because if mm-hmm. somebody were to do, there's lots of harm that could happen short of killing mm-hmm. our, our loved one that I might not want them on this earth either. Mm-hmm. I can't make policy based on that. You know what I mean? And the issue for me is not... Both of y'all are right. You're, one, you're just talking about policy, and he's talking about personal. He's not how he would feel. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I would absolutely. feel the same way. But here's the problem. It's, I'm not like a pacifist. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, it's not like I don't believe that violence is ever necessary. I don't believe that America... And, and here's my three reasons. One, it doesn't work. The argument is often that the death penalty um, stops people from, from people from committing these crimes. People don't. When people go get in shootouts and kill people, they're not thinking, well, is this a death penalty state? And all the evidence shows in some states where the death penalty is there, the murder rates are higher. Second thing is I don't believe um, that America has the moral authority That's right. to That's execute the most important its citizens. One to me. That's you know right. I mean? This nation simply, no That's nation... Right. Imagine born. I tell you killing's wrong and then I execute someone. Right, mm-hmm. exactly. And America does nothing but execute people right. here and abroad. Right? That's right. And lastly, we get it wrong too much. Mm-hmm. Right. There's definitely been people who have been wrongfully executed. All the time. The, the Innocence Project estimates that it's in the double digits. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so, the people who get executed look like us more. Or people who, you know... Right. Yeah. So, a lot of it is your representation, too. Like, the, what lawyer you can afford to have. Which you can't. There's people that commit the same crime, but they might not get executed in a place where there's death penalty because they had a better lawyer. Right. So think about it like that. If, if somebody did harm to somebody you love, mm-hmm. and they think they got the guy, but they said there's a there's a, there's a... 10% chance it's the wrong guy. Would you still want that person executed? No. Right. And so if you think about death penalty as a, as a, on a macro level, mm-hmm. we do get it wrong like 10% of the time. You see what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So so that's the day. And I know what you say. If I know who it is, I see him yeah. on tape. That, you know, I, I wouldn't that's say true. this. I, I, would have a, I would offer you an off-camera solution to such a, to such a problem. But, but I would try to but do it be the police myself too. But I also look at it like this as well. Like I look at, at New York's gun, gun laws, right? I hate mm-hmm. New York gun laws, right? But... You want them to be less strict or no, more no. strict? I'm going to tell you this. Uh. When somebody commits a crime in New York or has a gun in New York, they know that if they walk around with a gun or they carry a gun, they're going to get three years. Mm-hmm. So I feel that sometimes it makes people double think about carrying that gun with yes, them. Yes, that's true. That's true. That, because the, that's the consequence. Yes. They understand the consequence. Yeah, some laws do prevent you from doing certain things. I'm not walking around with a gun in New York. I'm a gun owner. I, I don't carry it in New York because I can't. You right? carry it in Atlanta. Even L.A., you carry it in L.A. because you know you won't get that much time. But New York, you know, you you seen Lil Wayne get three years. Yeah. You seen Ja get three years. You seen... Plaxico Birds after Plaxico they won the Super Bowl. get three years after right. they won the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, you really York. getting them years. No, yeah. they, 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 they give so you the years. It, do? it makes you not want to carry that gun in New York. Yes. Which... which yeah, and some, some laws are good for that. But again, like I said, abolition is about the structural problem. So instead of just locking people up for carrying guns, let's work on getting guns out of our communities and creating a society where people don't need guns. Because, look, I, like I said, I have them because I need them, mm-hmm. right? I want to protect my home. I want to protect my family. But, you know, I'd love to live in a world where we did. And there's lots of countries that manage to protect people, keep the public safe. You can call them when somebody's breaking in your house, although there's fewer break-ins. And the poli- they don't even have an armed police force. Mm-hmm. So that ain't us. That ain't America. But no we can get there, man. We can get there. But first... To do that, we got to be able to see it, and that's why in the book we I talk think it's about too much money. Them, them gun, them gun manufacturers, <laughs> they 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 fund too much. But I, could, I, but could that, see, I like, would love for that to happen, but they fund too no, much. You, you, Gil Scott Heron said, "Everybody love peace. Problem is, you can't make no money off of it, right?" Mm-hmm. It's the facts. It's, it's, that, it's absolutely true. So again, we got to we, we got to attack capitalism. So we got to get at fundamental problems if we're going to fix this thing. We, we got to. Yeah, Mark's not wrong. It's just I'm just sitting here thinking like. To your point, I cannot imagine a world without police. And the only reason I say that is because what entity could we create that would put that fear? Like when you see it, when a, when you see a police car, you know to act right. You right. know what I mean? As a black person, I do. Yeah, when white right. people do yeah, it's customer yeah, yeah. service. They like, oh, I'm saying, they, 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 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, a, right. it's a different approach. No, you're right. so, so that's what I'm saying. I would live in a world where I don't have it. I don't want that yeah. fear. I mean, no, there are entities though. Because if you see you see the FOI, you know, straighten up. You know what I right. mean? Right. So but what would that look like? And protected by them, right? right? Yeah. So that's a great example. FOI is the yeah. perfect example. No, I right? agree. Yeah, when yeah, I see I FOI, I, mm-hmm. I feel protected. Yeah. I feel safe. Right. I feel like I can call them if I need something. And I don't feel like I'm in danger. But I don't feel like they... Yeah, I don't feel yeah. in danger. And I ain't never seen a gun. You feel like morally they'll do the right thing. They'll, yes. they'll, they'll secure everybody, but everybody will be treated with respect. Yeah, and they don't walk around with 45s or, or, or 9mm on their, on their waist. Yeah, they and should, I still though. feel safe. I want them to, though. That's a whole other story. <laughs> they, Even, they managed to do it since since, since July 4th, 1930, yeah. without, without it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. look. I, Even they, if I think about, like, Montserrat, where my mom is from, the island, there's mm-hmm. basically no crime there. And people leave their doors open. and But it's a small place, right? People know everybody each other. Everybody knows yeah. everybody. Yeah. You know, and People 5, also have jobs. People. people also have jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, 
right? I mean, like I wouldn't say it's a you know rich place at all because it's it's definitely diverse financially is what what sure. people have and don't have. But but I guess what I'm saying is if people's needs are being met, they, people typically don't steal. There'll be occasional people, mm -hmm. but in general, if people's needs are being met, not rich, just people's needs are being met. And there's not mass poverty and mass homelessness and mass drug addiction. That's where you start to see the harm and the violence and all this other stuff. And so I, I'd rather live in a place where there's more equality, even though there's fewer gaps. You know what I mean? There's fewer billionaires, and few, but there's also fewer people with nothing. Like that's mm -hmm. that. I think then we'd have a safer world too. I wonder how many people, how, how many people have you spoken to that lived through like the Black Panthers era, oh, or, or, or even in Philly with um, move, move, move. You know what I mean? Like how, how did they say the communities work? They did policing of their own communities, right? And you know, a lot of there was there's been a very successful community policing effort in North Philadelphia and in West Philadelphia, um, and they have worked. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when the Panthers were there. You know, that was a big part of it. It wasn't just a breakfast program, although that helped, right? Again, they met people's needs, right? Um, it was also about community policing. Mm -hmm. It was about cop watch programs. We had, we started a cop watch program in the 90s, again, post Rodney King when I was a teenager, where, you know, when, when police pull you over, we stand there to watch to make sure nothing happens. The next step from cop watch was to say, we're not just going to watch police watch you. Mm -hmm. Let's let's step in and actually watch our own neighborhood. And it, it is successful, but, but you need more people. You need bodies. But the problem is you take away the jobs. You know, you lock people up for drug sales. You do, you do all these things that take, you know, valuable resources out of the community. And then you leave the young people in without any without any old heads in the neighborhood. So now you got more conflict, more violence, more harm being com mm -hmm. being being committed and none of the kind of oversight that you need to stop it. So it, it, it like the system worked against us and we have to fight back. Yeah, it would be amazing to have a security system in place that I guess you, you're not taking a gamble on. Cause that's what it is with police, right? Mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. Like it's a gamble, yeah. you know? It's we, a gamble. Yeah. It's a gamble and I don't, we can't keep gambling cause we, we lose. Yeah. Black people lose, poor people lose. So we, we gonna figure something else out. You know, we gonna figure something else out. All right. Mark Lamont Hill, seen and unseen, mm -hmm. out right now. Go get it with Todd Brewster. Yeah, great conversation. Appreciate always, you, brother. Appreciate always, man. Man, love y'all. Pick up the book now. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.